Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. So, uh, book two of the Hound and the Falcon trilogy. Um, as I always do when I have one of these covers, here you go, here's the trilogy in one book uh, dust jacket. Um, and over here we have, once again, picked, because it's at least somewhat more consistent stylistically, uh, an individual cover of the book two, which is called The Golden Horn. Uh, this is, of course, in reference to that particular part of the world uh, which holds Istanbul, which was once Constantinople. Constantinople. Uh, and uh, I should probably correct that, but I'm not going to, because I just do these in one take and roll with whatever I get. Um, so... This is, continues obviously to be historical fantasy, but this time, this time it's not uh, involving a made-up country with, uh, with some made-up, uh, arguments, uh, made-up potential conflict. I mean, I don't know, Ritherk, maybe, maybe he actually existed, but I suspect that Given that Rihanna is an entirely fictional country, uh, that most of what happened in the first book was uh, was fictional in a general sort of way. Um, this book, however, is taking place in during an event that actually happened. That is the sack of Constantinople by the Western Latin invaders. Uh, see, the thing is that the Crusades were genuinely horrible in a lot of ways, and they went on for a very, very long time. Um, the thing is, though, that Constantinopolis, uh, Byzantium, the city of Constantine, that which at one point was the center of the Roman Empire, um, Constantinople now Istanbul in Turkey, was the gateway between the West and the Middle, and what we now consider the Middle East. Uh, if you were going from Europe, particularly Western Europe, and trying to get to the Holy Land, trying to get to Jerusalem, trying to get to those places which are considered to be the holiest in, Christ in Christendom, you would almost inevitably pass by or through the Golden Horn and pass by or through Constantinople. Um, and this was this was one of the most impressive, greatest cities in the world. Hagia Sophia, uh, to this day, remains one of the genuine engineering feats of the Middle Ages. Um, there is... There is... Probably not a dome to equal it uh, for centuries and centuries. This is, it's really, really incredible. And even though it's a mosque today and they have ripped out nearly everything that was in there uh, back in the 1200s, it is still an incredible, an incredible piece of architecture. Um, and so this was... This was an incredibly wealthy city, and it was also a city at the center of the Orthodox uh, Church. Uh, because, of course, you had the first of the major schisms of the Church was between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, uh, because the Orthodox Church uh, didn't believe that there should be a Pope, didn't believe in the Pope. Um, they tend to call him the Bishop of, uh, they've tended to call him the Bishop of Rome in scathing terms because it's sort of, they feel like this is the Bishop of Rome who's getting, putting on airs. Uh, but anyways, so Alf and, uh, Althea, Thea, um, have arrived in this region. Uh, it's run by the Greeks and... Taya is from there, originally. She's Greek, she is Orthodox Christian, um, and the book actually opens in the small, in the town that was her home growing up. The thing about Taya, though, is that Taya, like Alf, they are 
elves. They are changelings. They are whatever they are. They are not even sure what they are. What they do know is that they are ostensibly or apparently very likely immortal. Certainly, they are long-lived enough that they both look like teenagers and Thea's family is dead and gone. Uh, it's been decades and decades and there is no one left. And so this book opens with her being faced with this and she turns to Alf for comfort, but also they're in love, but he's in denial and she's sort of having a trauma moment. And so he is on the one hand being rational because he's sort of all, you know, Taya, you're grieving, your family is gone, I'm not going to sleep with you when you're in this kind of state. Uh, but also he's in denial. He's also insisting that, no, he loves her only as a sister, and she is really, really pissed off. She is sick of this because she has been following him everywhere. She is in love with him and thought that, you know, he was going to fall back in love with her. And uh, when he keeps on insisting that he loves her only as a sister, she finally just loses her temper and shapeshifts and storms off and Alf immediately sinks into depression and decides to forego any sort of sun protection and pitches over sideways from, you know, heat and sun exhaustion, even though he has magical powers that he could use to protect himself, he just decides to ignore it and winds up horrifically sunburnt and gets picked up by uh, Sophia Akestas. And the Akestas are the family that Alf stays with, that Alf gets adopted into, that are at the center of this book, and indeed in a lot of ways wind up being at the center of the next book. Because uh, the Akestas are a very, very well-to-do family, and Sophia insists on bringing him with her. Uh, when... When a doctor comes along and sees Alf, the doctor immediately identifies Alf as some sort of supernatural not-human and is all, you can call a priest to drive the devil away, I'm not going to treat him. And Sophia doesn't put up with this because, one, she doesn't think that Alf is a supernatural who's it, but also, I hired you as a doctor to be a doctor, be a doctor. But she brings Alf home with her. Uh, and Alf winds up Effectively, he winds up getting hired as a tutor for their three children. Uh, Irene, the eldest daughter, Anna, the second child, and uh, the youngest, Nikiforos, Nikki for short, who is uh, born a deaf mute. And over the course of this book, Alf, because he's got magical superpowers, can communicate telepathically with Nikki and is able to teach him how to read and write, and then Nikki takes it one step further and figures out some magic powers of his own to communicate telepathically on his own, to hear people telepathically. He, he learns enough. He doesn't have magical superpowers. He's still human, but he does have this one thing. He's developed this telepathy, which he can use in lieu of hearing um, and in lieu of actually speaking. And... So, over the course of this book, we watch as Alf goes through a series of developments of, you know, getting himself hired as a doctor at one of the most big-named, well-to-do hospitals that treat everybody and all comers, and his discovery that he is being paid to do this work. Um... And his adoption into the family, but also eventually his realization that he's in love with Thea and a wonderful back and forth between them because when he finally realizes he's in love with her, he asks her to marry him and she tells him no because she doesn't want, because she feels, and one gets the feeling she is not entirely wrong, that Alf is asking her to marry him not because... He wants to spend the rest of his life with her, but because marriage takes away the sin. And her stance is, I don't want you to marry me 
because it's taking away the sin. I want you to marry me because you want to be in a relationship with me for the rest of our lives. And, you know, they're two very different things. It's sort of, I love you, so let's get married so it's okay to have sex, as opposed to, I love you, and I want to make a commitment to you to be with you for the rest of my life. They're very, very different things. And she is, I, in my opinion, absolutely right to turn him down um, in that particular event. You know, not that she's saying that, you know, she doesn't want to be with him or anything else. It's that she doesn't want to marry him if he's doing, if he's doing it for what are effectively the wrong reasons. Um, and so there's that, but there's also the Latin invasion, and we're, we're calling them the Latins because that's what they're called in the book, and by Latins, I'm not talking about Latinos, I am talking about the Latin-speaking peoples of Western Europe, because Latin is the lingua franca. Um, that is the language of the Franks, because everybody in the East called anyone from west of where they were Franks. Even though the Frankish were just, like, people in France, you know, Franks, French, France, it, origin point, but that didn't matter what, you know, if you were from England, you were Frankish, if you were from Denmark, you were Frankish, if you were from Germany, you were Frankish. Uh, they, they, as far as they were concerned, they were all just Franks, they were all Latins. They all, they were all people who spoke Latin as opposed to Greek. Um, anyways, this point in the, uh, course of, in the course of the Crusades was when basically the West got real tired of those smug Greeks sitting in their super rich city and decided that they were just going to conquer it because reasons. Uh, I believe somebody in the church made up some weird philosophical reasons and those reasons were bull, but they went ahead and did it anyways. Uh, we also get a return of a guy whose first name I've never been quite sure how to pronounce and haven't bothered to look it up. Uh, it's spelled uh, J-E-H-A-N uh, de Sévigny. Um, I guess that it might even just be Jean. I don't actually know, uh, and I'm not looking it up because I don't do research for these things unless I really, really feel like it because that's not what this is about. Um, this is about me aimlessly rambling about things and occasionally about the fact that I don't do research. Anyways, uh, he returns in this book. He was he is, in a fact, in all three books in this series. And, you know, he is delighted to see Alf again and they have they have their moments. And and Jean does have his. He does have his personal problem because the Greeks are Christian. They're Orthodox, not Catholic, but they are Christian. And he he has a crisis of conscience on the topic of killing Christians while on crusade on behalf of Christendom. Um, and so you have a lot of back and forth about that. A lot of back and forth about the Greeks and the concern many people have about, you know, why are why are our people cowards and the fall of a great city, the fall of an empire. And on the other side, you have the Latins who are like, why are, you know, you have people like Jean who are, you know, wanting to know why they're doing this, who are looking at this, this attempt to take over a Christian city run by Christians instead of you know, trying to take the Holy Sepulchre, which is in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is not actually all that near to Constantinopolis. Um, so there's a lot. By the end of the book, Alf is adopted into the Acestus family, and most of the family gets killed in the due course of the book, leaving him with Nikki and Anna, and at the end of the book, everybody decide they wind up heading back west, taking the two children with them because he promised the children that as long as they needed him, he would be there for him. And they're just like, yeah, and you can't just abandon us with our family in Nicaea. We're going with you. You promised, and so you have to take care of us. So um, 
that's how that ends, and uh, I have now rambled for most of my self-allotted 15 minutes, so that's everything, and I will see you all next week.